Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with New Roll, the business podcast that brings the boardroom to you. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of New Roll, the board search specialist and market leader bringing science to the art of board hiring. At this point, my marketing team suggested a lengthy piece on why more boards should be using New Roll to hire their next chair, non-executive director, trustee or board advisor. Rather than bore you with that, I'll cut to the chase. With a market leader now in the board space doing a thousand board placements annually, and we focus exclusively on non-executive appointments, giving us deep and current board search expertise. Our members tell us they want more roles. If every person listening now could send just one board role New Roll's way in the next three years, opportunities will increase exponentially for everyone. As the saying goes, communities grow great when people plant trees whose shade they will never know. Today's guest, Marta Krupinska, is a founder, CEO, investor, and board member. Marta has substantial experience in and passion for technology. She chairs Youth Business International, a global network supporting underserved entrepreneurs, and Aqua Ocean, a pioneer in hydrogen-powered shipping. She is CEO and co-founder of Curate, a carbon removal firm, and she was formerly head of Google for Startups UK and co-lead of Google's Black Founders Fund Europe. Marta, a huge welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Robert. I um, love this podcast. So excited to be here. Marta, you gave a brilliant talk for startups, which was titled How Not to Die, which included 10 Reasons Startups Fail, and it's out there on YouTube. You talked about founders falling out, running out of money, getting culture wrong, not testing and learning, making stuff people don't want, ignoring competition just not having the potential to be big enough, being too optimistic, getting distracted, and just giving up. In my mind, all of those things are things that a good board can help with. But what's your perspective on that? It's really interesting because, you know, when we think about the life cycle of a startup, uh, very many don't necessarily have a board from the get-go. And I think you're right. These are some of the, the checks and balances that a good board could put in. And actually, even if an early stage company does not have a board, it's something that arguably the founders or the founders and the executive team should be checking for. So actually, I'm a huge fan of having boards from the get-go because it creates a cadence and a rigor of stopping every three months for a few hours and actually checking, have we moved on our key KPIs? Do we actually know what they are? Are we progressing against competition? Are we integrating enough insights into the business from the market, from the clients, from the suppliers? How is our team feeling? What are some of the big governance or policy developments? You know, should we, the whole world is talking about ESG. Do we have an ESG strategy or should we have one? And how do we measure impact? And I think having been a, a founder multiple times and having sat on boards, I feel like it's so easy to as a founder, get really bogged down by the day-to-day -day and just survived, you know, the Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday. And I think, as you say, the right board, which in the first instance could be the founders and, or the founder and executive team, or, you know, the right investors, and I suspect that's something that might be worth talking about, structured in the right way and not as a punitive board, make sure that we've delivered the things that we promised to, but a board that actually can play more of a, a supportive role could do could do exactly that. Speaking from experience, recently at Curate, we raised a 5.4 million pound round from Google Ventures, Capital T, and a few others. And we're literally organizing our first board meeting. And we're basically talking about it being, you know, a bunch of pre-read within three hours of having a couple of really smart people around the virtual table and attacking some of our big questions. Like, what a privilege to be able to do that. And actually, I think it entirely makes sense that anybody would. I love that. It reminds me actually a lot of another founder that I spoke with talking about the value of their board. And, and they always said to me, your board should be your highest return on time, of time invested in any given period, which I always thought was a lovely benchmark to hold oneself up to as a board member or as a founder, trying to make sure that your board was, is adding value. So many startups seem to struggle with their boards. And you've seen lots through your role as, as head of startups at Google and obviously in, in your role as a founder. What do you see as the most common reasons that people go wrong with their boards? If we speak about startup founders specifically, I don't think most founders have the opportunity to optimize for the quality of the human behind the money. 
you know, it's, it's, it's in most cases, it's near impossible to build a business unless you're able to capitalize it. And most founders are not necessarily in the position to choose who the money is coming from. And I've seen this over and over and over again. Either you prioritize being able to get the right amount of cash at the right valuation, which is a challenge in itself. I think we spend too much time talking about the economics of investments and not enough about the governance associated and, and how much power you're giving away. But I think even, you know, if, if the economics are right, then I think still, is this the right partner? Does this partner have relevant experience? Do you get along as humans? I always thought the whole mythology of closing rounds was quite interesting because, oh, I've closed the funding. Well, it basically, it means I've just gotten married to this set of humans that I am going to be tied to for as long as my business is in existence. And, and how it is that even in the language, we focus more on the process of closing the money in the account rather than opening an entire new chapter of a company where these investors or these board members play an absolutely critical role. So I suppose the one piece of insight for me is, and again, completely understanding that not every founder is going to have the liberty to choose. It's in the process of the investors interviewing you and seeing whether you're the right fit for them. Also understanding if they are the right fit for you and actually trying to negotiate it again, a little bit like in marriage. It's better to talk about what are we going to, to do when our parents get older or where are we going to live or do we want to have children? It's, it's easier to have this conversation before you tie the knot. And equally with the investors, I think I would spend some of the time on how are we going to resolve all of those issues? How much of this should live in our investment documents? And how do I give myself a reasonable point of view on what the path ahead is going to look like? And I suppose the last point that I would make on this is also just normalizing in the startup community that that we as founders have the right to expect more than just capital from investors. I hear over and over again about investors who don't show up to meetings, don't do any prep, and you know, only call up every six months to check, you know, are you at 100K ARR yet? And I think that just shouldn't be good behavior and we should scrutinize it and we should probably name and shame those investors to also make sure that, you know, that they feel ownership or at least co-ownership for the outcomes that they're trying to drive, the more helpful they are. That's what, for me, a good investor is an investor that sees that the more helpful they are, the more money they're going to get for their investment. Really interesting. I was talking to a founder recently who had obviously been through a slightly tricky time, scaled up, had to, had to scale back, and obviously only had investor directors on their board, and they were thinking about bringing in a chair. And what was became very clear from the conversation we were having was that there wasn't alignment around what everyone wanted from the board. The founder just wanted a board that was going to help them raise money, whereas the board wanted to make sure that the money that they were putting in, because they were all investor directors, was being appropriately allocated and generating an appropriate return. But the founder was looking for their value add challenge and support away from, aside from the fundraising, from a different forum. They had other channels for that. What have you seen that's worked best in that regard? I mean, do, do you ever see investor directors adding value? And, you know, I've seen a lot of, especially earlier stage investor directors actually not add much value. And, and part of that is because they're, they're investing across such a broad portfolio. You know, they're taking 100 bets and, and the hope that two of them will make the portfolio that they haven't got time to mm -hmm. add, add it. By the time they've taken their, you know, whatever it is, 220 working days a year, that's sort of, you know, two days a year per portfolio it's you you can't you can't do anything meaningful in that time but what have you seen where investor directors have added value in crudest terms just to open this up if you don't have the time to be a board member then don't be there is no mass to invest with a board seat some firms just take a view that they can't afford to have another board seat and then they would opt in to either be an observer or just not take a board position at all and Maybe if you do require it by how your fund is structured, then look to hire more people. I don't believe that it should be founders paying the price for a fund pushing for a governance structure that frankly is a distraction from day-to-day -day running of the business if they aren't getting any ROI on that distraction. So for me, I'm in an unusual position. I'm a, I'm a pre-seed firm with a board. And Luna Schmidt, one of the partners at GV, is on my board. By the way, quick plug, I have an all-female board. I'm so proud of that. It's so cool. And it's actually really rare. But if 
the reason why I was happy at Precinct to have a board is because I believe that the humans on this board are going to add value to my operation. If I didn't feel that was the case, I would have pushed not to have a board. So I think a lot of it is asking the question of when does it actually make sense? And to your point around our board directors, broadly value additive, I'd say they very much can be. Being a founder or a CEO can be an incredibly lonely experience. If you have the right psychological safety with the investor and if you believe that the investor is there to help you rather than wait for you to trip up, then, you know, if we assume that venture capital is success in venture capital, is, it's, it's knowledge economy, right? These are firms that, or these are partners or, or investment managers that speak to entrepreneurs and other investors day in and day out. This should automatically be a very interesting resource if you're willing to ask the difficult questions or admit that something isn't exactly right. If all you're doing is pretending that everything's going great, I don't know how much value that's going to give you. But there is power to vulnerability. Vulnerability is a weakness. And if you say, my cells are in developing as well as I thought so, these are some of my sort of hypotheses. What do you think? Or, you know, I, I'm seeing pull from the US, but I'm worried there's going to be distraction. What would you say? Or what are you seeing other founders to do or are doing? I think that that's definitely a way to add value using a good investor as a sounding board. Um, not to mention that in principle, investors should have great access to talent. Ultimately, what, what is the first thing that founders start spending money on after raising money? Largely, it's hiring. What if you could actually qualify some of that talent or source it through the networks of your investors or from different companies that they'd also invested in when they've seen talent come through the pipe over the years? That should be completely possible. A lot of investors coming from corporate roles or finance roles, they should be able to broker good, good intros and not to mention then help you get follow-on investment. These things, as far as I'm concerned, should be normalized and they should be expected. If an investor isn't doing that and claims to have a board seat, I think something is seriously wrong. And I have seen founders complain to one another, either directly or through platforms like Landscape Ventures ran by Joe Perkins. There is increasingly a view in the ecosystem of who's adding value and, and who isn't. The biggest challenge I would say is when you have those investors that literally just call you up every so often, mostly to tear you down and or tell you how you're not performing well. And again, for a founder that often is already under stress, is in charge, has the whole team to keep happy and motivated, and probably themselves are, you know, challenging themselves and wondering, am I doing the right thing? To on top of everything else, be receiving calls at 11 p.m. on a Friday going, why aren't you further? I mean, frankly, I think those investors that I know exist should probably be ashamed of themselves because I don't believe that anybody is going to perform better in this environment. It's amazing how much we hear that refrain of investors who say they add value through their portfolio approach, cross-pollination, and yet the reality of the number actually doing it is infinitesimally small. I had a really nice hack from a founder who shared with me what one of the things they do in their monthly update. They basically write all the names of the board members down and then a little line for the value that they've added each month. And if they haven't added any value, it just gets left with a blank space. And as I started employing this with our own advisory board members, and it was amazing how powerful it is because you suddenly get them calling you up before the, the couple of days before they know the monthly report going out is going out saying, you do know I was helping your CTO with this or whatever it might be and created this competitive dynamic. Are there any things that you've seen either on the startups that you've been involved with directly or, or through your role at Google where you've seen people really getting the most out of their, mm -hmm. their board by hacks like that? Or? I think that's a brilliant hack. I've not heard of it before and now I'm, I'm tempted to use it. I'd say the, the one thing that is sometimes easy to overlook, as trite as it sounds, is that founders and board members are humans. And that the more you invest in a relationship and the more they personally care about you and about your mission, about your product, and the more they're up to speed, the easier it is for them to help. And some often are slightly out of depth. Not everyone is an absolute expert in the field in which your company operates. So the thing that I've seen work quite well, and I've used it both as a founder or a CEO and, and as a chair at, at YBI, where um, we have quite a big board with a lot, incredibly senior, you know, Accenture, KPMG, Brunswick PR, you know, you name it, and incredibly busy people late in their careers. Some of it is making sure that in between board meetings, you actually have a meeting that you take the time, you know, meet for lunch 
every three months and think about it strategically. What are the things that this particular person could help me with? Invest in them a little bit and ask them for help. Now, one of the things I think just by the way the humans are structured, if you know that you have a meeting upcoming, you will quite often just make sure that you've cleared your to-do list for that person ahead of time. So I think creating space and giving time for those board members to deliver for you whilst it's time consuming, arguably, again, if the board member is value additive, it's going to deliver that ROI on the time that you're putting in. And, and you might have just come away from it with a stronger relationship. Really interesting. And you talked a little bit about the board that you've put together and why you put it together at such an early stage. Do you have in your mind a clear set of objectives that if they've achieved X in Y amount of time, they would have done a stellar job? Or how do you think about their value contribution? Mm. A really good question. So we're basically three directors, me, my co-founder, a partner at GV, and then one observer, co-founder of Capital T. So there's four of us. Obviously, that's a very different dynamic to a dynamic of, say, a Series B company where I've seen, you know, seven to 10 people on board. I, that might sound naive. I think the board should have the same objectives as the company. So if my goal as a company is to deliver on a sales, on a sales goal, get my software product to a particular state and launch an MVP of, of, say, a financial product, if these are my goals, then I should be making sure that my board is helping me achieve those goals because they're brokering intros to potential clients, because maybe they're helping me put together a hiring plan for my engineering team, and because they're introducing me to capital partners. I wouldn't overcomplicate it. Obviously, that's at an early stage. I think later on, boards have more of a governance role. It becomes a little bit more complex. But if I think about, for argument's sake, let, let's look at Aqua. And I think Aqua, you know, super interesting, very complex, hardware business, liquid hydrogen powered autonomous marine drones. Like it took, it's a mouthful. It took me a minute. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge opportunity, but a very complex space. Because of the technical and commercial opportunities, there's such a tendency to be entirely bogged down on the detail of the everyday delivery. The way that we've set out parameters and KPIs for the board was how it's going to allow us to zoom out, look at the strategy and verify that the delivery is appropriate for where, how the market has moved. And potentially if we hadn't had that forum to do it, then it would have been harder to verify if the direction of the company is correct. So again, it kind of goes back to the first point that I made earlier around how do you, how do you use the board as an opportunity to scrutinize your progress, but not in a way that's punitive, but in a way that is strategic. Got it. Now, there are a number of points there that, that you touched on. I'd like to pick up on some more. So one of them was that you talked about that journey of the board going from sort of the stage that you're, you're at now with Curate through to sort of Series B when you're talking about seven to 10 non-execs. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most common problems I hear from founders at that stage where they've got all these investors often who invested in a much earlier stage who've clung on to that board seat and are not adding much value at that point either because the business has moved beyond their ex area of expertise or because their significance in the capital structure has diminished and they didn't have some sort of provision in their docs that said if your ownership percentage falls below 15 percent then you automatically come off the board. You've, you've been through this journey before, you've seen as a founder, you've seen lots of others go through the journey. What other common problems have you seen people running into yep. as the board scale? So I think you touch upon an incredibly important issue. This example of board members holding on to a seat is, is such a common one. And I think Again, it goes back to the point around how do we understand the economics of the deal when you're taking money and the governance. If anyone listening to this podcast that is in startup land hasn't read Secrets of Sandhill Road by Scott Cooper, I could not recommend it more. It's basically a Bible and I've now read it probably four times. And when we were closing my last round, I reread it again to make sure that I have it front of mind. Because again, it's so easy to over-index on, am I getting the right amount of money? But in the tech community, we don't spend enough time thinking about what are the pitfalls on the governance side. The amount of power that you're giving away and at which stages, I think is really, really important. So for instance, what I've seen a lot of is 
do you have to run big purchasing decision past your board? So are you able to are you able to hire somebody or find a new lease on an office without the board approval? Now, I can sort of understand why, how investors might want to have some level of control, but also it just creates levels of governance and oversight and process that can impair a functioning of any organization. So sort of what those levels are are really important. You know, how do you define good lever and bad lever, both in terms of the founders, their executive team, or their future staff? What happens should there be an opportunity to sell? And is it yourself or is it your investors that bring that forward? Do you have to sell or do you have the right to veto? Do all of your investors have to sell on the same terms? You know, obviously, I think there's quite a lot of conversation around things like liquidation preference, which, again, is very, very linked to the economics of the deal. But I've seen founders think that they're getting a fantastic deal because they're getting a great valuation. But then it turns out that should something go wrong, their equity in the business is entirely obliterated. Two examples from personal experience. Don't try and save money on lawyers, especially if it's your first fundraise or the first more complex transaction. It will almost always come and bite you down the line. And the second one is don't rush this process and don't sign something that you don't understand. And I actually find it infuriating that there is still so much language. I spent so much time with my lawyers recently and we were talking about the meaning of words and we're all in agreement that a lot of those words are literally there just to confuse you. And I think many founders, especially first-time founders, might feel intimidated or not want to admit that they don't know exactly what something means. It's the most, it's, it, these are the documents that will govern your everyday operations for the longest time, often giving precedent to certain behaviors, for instance, giving, giving rights to your, you know, you might think, oh, it's not that important. It's just my first fundraise or second fundraise, but, but it might create precedent for future investors not to want to not get it. And this is how we end up with boards of 10 people or 12 people, because everybody has a right to a board seat. I, it's, 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 it's stressful. But I think in a world that's, that's increasingly interconnected and also with communities of founders being super supportive of one another, one of our biggest achievements at Google for Startups, we really over-indexed on creating communities of founders that can be a resource for one another. When I look at the WhatsApp groups from the Black Founders Fund, where continuously there is, I need an agency for this, or I need to hire that person, or my investor just gave me this ultimatum, or I've just been given this offer and I don't know how to approach it. There should always be founders around you that will have been in this position before and will be able to advise. There's so much richness in there, Martha. And so many of those things really resonated with stories I hear from lots of different founders that that one around investor directors overstretching. I remember talking to a founder not so long ago who was competing for some really scarce talent as sort of CTO, and they'd eventually found this person. They'd been through months of looking for the person, really competitive process. And just when they were making the offer, the board came and said, well, we'd all like to meet them. And then effectively said, well, we're not available for the next four months. We can't get all our, our, our diaries aligned. So this poor founder just completely lost it. And similarly, actually, another founder I was talking to recently who just been through the hell of a, high, uh, of a fundraising process and just the sheer relief that they had managed to secure the funds completely switched off with all the detail of the documentation that you talked about. And lots of other examples that like that that all say to me that sort of would point to the value of having an independent director on that board. That often those investor directors don't always aren't always operating with their fiduciary responsibilities uh, in mind. They're often there with their investor director hat on, and sometimes get confused between the two. What's been your experience of independent directors, and how do you think about that for your your own board? Um, super interesting question because we actually negotiated that we could appoint a non-exec. And again, it's really early in the journey. And I was thinking about what are some of the gaps that we have as founders and what is that sort of third person's perspective that, that could be valuable? And we are not necessarily confident that we will appoint a non-exec straight away, but we wanted to have that option. I wonder if some of this is also more of a challenge in Europe because more VCs in Europe come from a strictly finance background rather than our exit founders or operators that can speak more from experience. But I can definitely say both in my experience as a founder before and investing, 
Um, sometimes you get an opportunity to appoint or tie down an exceptionally senior person who won't be particularly exercised about being an advisor, or maybe you can't give them a contract. But actually, if you gave them a board seat, that might be exciting. And then that obviously also adds to the weight of your brand. That adds to your ability to show up in the world in the right way. Now, I would be incredibly careful with making these appointments. I We've done it in one of my previous companies once before and quite poorly. I would say try and start with building a relationship. And also generally with these roles, if somebody is mostly doing it for glory or recognition or money, then they're probably the wrong person. Ideally, they'd be passionate about your business and excited about you. And as you see that this relationship is developing and nicely, then that's an icing on the cake to extend that offer of would you like to join our board? But it's almost like, in my experience, a good non-executive director could be a thoughtful, independent third party who doesn't have the interest of the investors front of mind, but also isn't a founder, so isn't precious. And I think even the best of us often can feel a little bit close to a particular problem. So it might be hard to stay objective. So as ever, if it's the right person qualified in the right way, I think having an opportunity to appoint them is excellent. Not to mention that, um, especially if you don't have multiple founders, sometimes they're also important to balance out the board so you don't end up with losing the majority to investors so early. Really interesting. Again, so, so much there to, to, to pick out. There was a really nice bit of research that I think came out of Oxford that showed that startups with board members outperformed and those with board members with past entrepreneurial experience did even better. Though I've been involved with an experience where just sort of there as an independent director but brought an investor background to to the role, which actually ended up being really helpful to the management team or the, the, the founders to offset a little bit some of the classic tricks that investor directors will play. And so maybe that's one startup should be thinking about more is bringing in independents who have an investment background to just help them navigate that space in a fairer fight, so to speak. The other one that you touched on was around the duration of boards. What I observe in the startup space is actually you often want to change out your board members faster than a larger, more established organization. And often people set up these contracts for like three, five years or indefinitely, and there's no termination baked into it rather than having it so that it's, this is a one month or one year appointment and, and you come off unless we agree that we extend it by a year and some basic things like that. And then the, the, the final thing that really jumped out at me was that passion versus experience piece. And again, I think that's a common pattern we see playing out where people tend to, when they're hiring board members, over-index on experience and underweight the importance of passion and, and someone who's willing to engage and you know, prove themselves. But there was, there was one other thing that you touched on there, which is observers. And I think people often underestimate the impact of observers and they think, well, what harm can it be to have an observer in the room? But actually, you know, anyone who's ever had a heated discussion with someone else knows that when you've got someone else in the room, the nature of that discussion changes massively because suddenly people have, you know, face to lose or how do you want to think about it? But it brings the sort of the ego into the room in a, in a different way. So time is flying by. But before we move on to the sixth question, quick fire, I just want to quickly explore one last topic with you, which is around, you know, how you think about taking on board roles yourself as a founder. And I always really encourage people to do it. It's there's a nice piece that came out of um, a group of McKinsey partners, which showed it was one of the hallmarks of the highest performing CEOs is that they always have an independent board role that they will learn from it, bring fresh ideas back into into the business. But you know, you, you've got 168 hours every week, like everyone else, you are, you know, got everything flying at you as a founder. Why on earth is it that you are sitting on, in your case, multiple independent boards, what is it that you get out of it when you could be just concentrating 100% on the, the day job? I love that question. Somebody told me recently that a good CEO should be working on where the company should be in six months and thinking about where the company should be in 12 months. So a lot of it is about being able to learn and change perspectives and incorporate different points of view. And what an absolute privilege and an opportunity to learn that from other people's organizations. I think if my success on the job is predicated by my ability to see the future and see trends and, and build the most effective organization, operating around other 
founders or executives or organizations and being able to learn from them is exactly the way that I would do it. And every time I go into a board meeting, I come away with some little snippet or a little bit of insight into what I could borrow from what I've just experienced and how I could translate it into my own organization. So I think a lot of it is about learning. And I've been incredibly fortunate. You know, I started my first company at 19 years old, the first one in the UK at 24. Most of, if not everything I've ever learned, I've learned from people that were older and smarter than me, but often worked for me. So again, to think about what are the ways in which I can add value, my experience, my different perspectives, you know, my role as chair of YBI, I was very much appointed as young entrepreneur, now leading an organization that serves young entrepreneurs. I replaced an 84-year-old sir who used to be the global CEO of Visa and Standard Chartered Bank. So clearly there are different ways in which value can be value can be added. I think many find it intimidating to say, oh no, why, why me or why, why join a board now? But I think in a world where we think so much more about impact and diversity and not just diversity in terms of gender or race, but diversity of thought, I think that exchange of ideas at the highest strategic level is incredibly powerful. But aside from that, to your question of why the hell do I do it? Because I, I think it's the only way to make the only way it makes sense, the only way to move through the world. Again, what a huge privilege to to have a seat at the table, to have a voice, to be able to contribute. I think the world has changed a lot and we should be moving away from the model of work hard, get rich and do some philanthropy when when you're 70 years old. Like what are the ways in which we can give back? And some of us are able to maybe in some meaningful financial way do it much earlier in life. But I think it's an entire privilege that I am able to contribute to a global charity. I've learned so much in that role. What an incredible ride to be involved in a, you know, marine hardware startup. Actually, my experiences at Aqua contributed very much to my thinking around some of the challenges that led to the creation of Curate as a concept, because that's how I first learned about blue carbon. So all of it, I think, is an exchange of ideas and, and value and impact. And I would recommend to anyone to give it a try. Gosh, Marta, what an inspiring way to wrap that up. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to move on to the sixth question, quick fire wrap up, where I'm going to say a statement and ask you for a short response if you're ready. Let's do it. Best book every board member should read and why? I, I really, I'm, I struggle with best, but I was thinking about it and I think it should be the hard thing about hard things by Ben Horowitz. It just, especially for those board members that are not entrepreneurs, I think is just such a fascinating study of the psyche of an entrepreneur and what it truly looks like when things get tough. Love that one. Favorite quote and why? Oh, you're killing me with the favorites. First class strategy paired with second class execution will always lose to second class strategy and first class execution. And the reason why I really like that quote is because going back to this concept of feeling intimidated, I think some people go into the world of business or any other sort of professional careers thinking, oh, but I don't have an MBA from Harvard or oh, my parents didn't do this seven times before. And how am I good enough? And I actually think people can spend all the time in the world to come up with the best possible plan. And some of it is sometimes a function of access or resources or privilege. But the ability to execute in anger is entirely ours. And I've seen excellent plans fall through at execution level. And I've seen decent plans with some strong hypothesis that really came to shine in execution. I think there's just something empowering about that quote. Love it. Your best ever holiday and why? Oh, traveling is such an important part of my my life and probably the main source of, of inspiration. I'd say I'm between two. One is... When I left Asimo in late 2017, my then fiance and I went backpacking to Asia for three months. And it was just, I think it's very rare that entrepreneurs have an opportunity to properly step away. And this was me sort of trying to figure out what's next for me, but just an incredible opportunity to immerse myself into different culture, different way of life. I struggle to read when I'm in a job because my brain is really full. I read like 12 books, listened to 15 podcasts, and it was just this really fresh, powerful experience that I definitely treasure to this day. And also there's just something really freeing about just living out of a backpack. 
for a few months and realizing that you really don't need that much. And it was materialistic world in which we operate day to day kind of fades away. But the other one I have to mention, three years ago, I went to Mallorca by myself. By the way, I definitely think everybody should go on holidays by themselves, especially women. And I say especially women because I think socially we're conditioned often in a way that we're always looking out for other people or that's what society has sort of taught us to do. To actually just be by yourself for four days and exclusively and only think about what do I fancy right now is really powerful. And it was in Mallorca that the idea for Curate came. So I obviously, it may have been after a couple of glasses of wine. So I think about it very fondly. I love that. At your most significant professional insight today? I worry it will be unsophisticated, but I think it's powerful in the context of our discussion today. Everyone's faking it. Do you remember when like, you were a kid and you looked at your parents, you're like, oh my God, they have all of the answers. And then maybe you became a parent yourself or you just grew up and you realized that nobody has any idea what they're doing. And I actually think, I think this is largely true. Even the most senior people that I've had the chance to work with every day are faced with new challenges and, and, and new problems. And I think when you realize that all we can do is give it our absolute best and act with integrity and, and kindness to one another, but ultimately just give it the best possible try. I think it makes the, the, the entire game a little bit less stressful and a little bit more fun. So true. Are your favorite podcast? Well, I'm a big fan of Exponential View by Azim Azar. It's a little bit of an intellectual feast, like everything from how do we restructure capitalism so that it serves us to the dawn of AI. It's, it's just the right ratio of science, business and politics for my liking. Sounds brilliant. And last but not least, three things our listeners should take away from this podcast if they take nothing else. It's never too early to join a board, assuming the people that are hiring you for that board believe that you have something to offer. I'm not saying come in with nothing to offer, but I think if you're having second thoughts, if you're good enough, but the people that are hiring you for the job are telling you that you can add value, I would say trust them and, and give it a try. It's also realistically the only way in which we're going to bring more diversity to boards. So never too early for a board role and always some value to add. If you're a founder and raising money, please consider who you're taking money from, on what terms, and read A Secrets of <laughs> Sand Hill Row because it'll help you pay attention to some of the pitfalls on the governance side of things as you're signing your investment docs. And I suppose the third one is... That sometimes what goes around comes around because before I took the YBI role, I remember being on the plane and listening to the new role enter the boardroom podcast because I was prepping for my first board meeting at YBI. And here I am a couple of years later on the podcast. It's really, really cool. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, wow. What an amazing way to end. Marta, that's been such a treat. Thank you so much. And uh, good luck with uh, the new business. Really exciting. We look forward to seeing how you get on. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you listening. We've been blown away by the incredible feedback about how this podcast has been helping you get board roles and become better board members. This podcast is for you. So if you'd like to suggest guests, topics, difficult challenges, or you'd like to share stories about how the podcast has impacted you, or have suggestions on how we can improve, please email podcast at neural.com. That's podcast at neural.com. And let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, thanks again for listening and look forward to having you back here for the next discussion.